So how you doing? <laughs> hey, good morning, or good afternoon. My name is Chris Zarbaugh. I'm the lead pastor here, and we thought we would open up with friends because it is such a great, uh, well, first of all, it's energetic and it's awesome, but also it's the topic for our day. You've arrived for part number two of a four-part series we're in called Formed, and what we're talking about today is how our friends could or could not, you know, kind of move us along toward the future and the life that God has for us. Uh, they could hold us back or they could propel us forward. So uh, before we dive into that, we have a couple of things we want to draw your attention to. And that is the very first one, is that if you're brand new and visiting here today, uh, first of all, we want to welcome you, but also we would encourage you to go to the Hub, which is our welcome center in the center of the lobby. Uh, it's a place to get a free gift if you're new. Also, uh, you know, a place to answer questions, get connected to events, find out what we believe or anything else about Kensington is all a one-stop shop at the Hub. And uh, we have Easter coming around the corner. Let me go ahead and tell you the theme this year. The theme is called Possible, and it includes Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and all of our Easter services in one package. Palm Sunday, the title of that day is Could It Be Him? And then Good Friday, it, we ask the question, Could It Be Over? And then on Easter services, we're asking, Could It Be True? And we're asking now that you would go online and, and uh, download your free tickets uh, and, and pick the Easter service that you're going to. Now, you do not need tickets for Good Friday. There's several options there to show up for that. I encourage you to come to Good Friday, by the way. Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Easter all connect. It's going to be awesome. But I want you also to uh, invite people, select a service, and download tickets for everyone because uh, the holidays are designed for you to invite someone with you. In fact, a, a lot of you were invited to Christmas for the first time, and you've been coming back since then. And I've given this speech to your friends who invited you right here because, again, the holidays are designed to invite. So invite somebody with you so we can have a great Easter celebration and everybody can get an opportunity to come and be a part of it. Now, also, I want to go ahead and promote what we're having in the, in the great room at April 6th is Priscilla Schreier, and she is coming to uh, Shirer, Shirer, Shirer. And uh, she is coming uh, via simulcast, and so we're going to have a great time. Go online, register for that, and that's all I need to say if you're familiar with her. She's an incredible speaker, and uh, it's going to be incredible. So that's coming up right here. This is our very first conference slash simulcast we're having in this building, which is kind of cool. And then uh, finally, we are uh, today, as you walked in, you probably were handed envelopes, and, uh, and, and we're going to be doing something really cool with that at the end of our time together. But uh, I thought this would also be a good Sunday to introduce to you uh, another church that just our campus is helping launch. Uh, if you've been here a while, you know that we've done this like eight different times where we have actually put somebody on our stage and said, hey, they are starting a church in Macomb County, and we want to support them in, in every way possible. And so we've done that recently with Dave Kubiak in, in St. Clair Shores with Antioch Shoreline. We did that with Darren Weiss over in Shelby Township with Hope City Church. Well, now we're going to have a church that's going to be launching and starting brand new in our own backyard in Mount Clemens. And so please welcome, if you would, to the stage, John and Cece Pomeroy as they come out and share with us. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Now, I got to know these guys when Patrick Holden, our Traverse City pastor up in uh, Traverse City, he called me and said, I love this guy. He's one of my great friends. In fact, did he try to hire you? He did, didn't he, as, as the worship leader, right? Because he's a, he's a speaking pastor, worship pastor. He's the triple threat. Uh, and as good as he is, Cece's way better than him. And so, Cece, just tell us about who you guys are. 
Yeah, so um, we were both born and raised in Metro Detroit, and um, then our families um, separately moved to northern Michigan, and we ended up meeting um, at a church in Traverse City where we were doing ministry together. We were doing youth ministry, and then we went on to um, continue to do ministry together in our relationship, and we um, did youth ministry and worship ministry, and um, kind of had a little a hand in a little bit of everything. And um, so we've always felt like God um, would call us to plant a church someday. Uh, we didn't think that it would be this soon. And so about a year ago, we um, started to feel like God was um, prompting us to start the process. And so um, as we started to look um, for like, God, where do you want us to plant? Um, we felt called to come home. And so we. Uh, through the process, we fell back in love with Mount Clemens and Macomb County, um, and so we're just so excited um, to be here. We uh, just love the, the people that God has called us to here. That's awesome. And so, uh, John, I'd love for you to tell people, like, if they're considering, uh, I bet you several people are thinking to themselves, hey, I live in Mount Clemens. I drive past Mount Clemens to come here, or I have relatives or good friends in Mount Clemens, or even if they have any question at all about, maybe, uh, maybe they resonate with the mission or the style of your church. If you were to just tell us about New Anthem Church, what would you say? Yeah, so uh, for New Anthem Church, first of all, our name comes from uh, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 43 is one of our theme verses. And in the book of Isaiah, God tells uh, the people of Israel, he says, uh, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. I'm doing a brand new thing. I'm going to use you to do a brand new thing. And really what we felt pressed on the heart of my wife and I is to do a brand new thing uh, in Macomb County, in Mount Clemens specifically. And so there's some, there's some distinctives for our church that we think are going to be unique um, that God's called us to be. Um, one is a multicultural church, obviously, right, uh, is, a, is a multicultural church. Um, in that, uh, we want to have a multicultural worship. We believe that the church, man, we would love it to look like heaven is going to look, right? We'd love it to look like the kingdom of God. And so we want to have multicultural worship. We believe we can take all the great old songs, some of the great old hymns, and some of the great awesome modern songs that are coming out in worship today and combine them for an unbelievable worship experience. Uh, and, and, and then lastly, I think another distinctive for us is we really believe that church was created to be an experience for people. When we think back to the early church and the explosiveness of the early church, it's because people were experiencing church. They were participating in it. And church was uh, meant to be experienced, not just endured. Amen, church? And so um, we believe that that's um, God's kind of call for us and his heartbeat for us is that people could have an experience. Because when you have an experience with God on a Sunday, then it will affect, positively affect and impact your Monday. Amen? There it is. And there it is. The amen, right? That's awesome. And, and by the way, I love that. I love that feedback, and that's so encouraging. You know, it's like, hey, people are listening and, and agreeing. But um, I want to go ahead and just kind of throw out there that there is a difference between campusing and church planting. Uh, when we mentioned campuses at Kensington, they are Kensington services, Kensington leadership, they're the same, but church plants are different because they are all sorts of different kinds of people that either they find us or we find them, and we try to do our very best to resource them with, we try to send people with them. They say, hey, pray about it, and I would love nothing more than 200 of you to say, you know what, God is calling me to do this, and we don't see that as a competition. We see that as a win because we believe that that is, that is what God wants, and we want what God wants, and so we'd, I'd love for 200 of you to leave and go go, go, go uh, support uh, this new church, make sure it's healthy and thriving. And maybe some will go temporarily and, and just come back and serve and do their part, or maybe some will stay, uh, but also to support them financially, but then also with advice and relationship and, and you know, assistance and everything else to be a good friend and neighbor. So anyway, all that to say, uh, because, because a church plant looks different, We've always said that we believe that God starts different kinds of churches for all different kinds of people. So uh, if I'm thinking about maybe asking questions about New Anthem Church, is there a next step? And if so, where is it? Yeah, absolutely. I think the best next step is coming this Wednesday, March 27th, right here in the great room. We're going to be having our first Discover Night, uh, and that's just simply a time we can all get together, uh, just have some family time. We're going to share a meal. We're catering Chipotle, and uh, we can get together. And then the last few minutes here, a little bit more about the mission, vision, and purpose behind New Anthem Church. So that's a great starting point. 
Awesome. And I'm sure a lot of you, all you really heard was womp, 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 free Chipotle. <laughs> womp, 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 right? And uh, so free Chipotle is a good thing, right? If you have any questions at all, when we end our service, there's going to be a lot going on. It's so exciting. But we're going to also remind you that his table and, and her table and their table is at uh, near the kids' entrance. It's a big blue display, New Anthem Church. Would love for you to stop by there. Hey, do me a favor. Give these guys a huge round of applause, all right? <laughs> Go for the hug, man. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it so much. Well, we are excited to continue our day as we talk about the influence of friends and the friends in our lives as God calls us to do a personal inventory and to consider what he might have for us here this morning. So as we continue on, I'd love for you to stand up and say hi to the people around you here. still find Wiley's house Riding on my bike with eyes closed I can name every girl that he took out From my memory dial his house phone Can you take me back when
Well, as I was listening to that song, I was reminded when I first uh, graduated from high school and went into ministry, I remember someone saying to me that when, when men, uh, I can't speak for women, but I found this to be true of men. Someone told me a long time ago, when men graduate high school and they move on with their adult life, that they claim that they have sometimes no friends or only one or two at the most. And I remember thinking when I was so young, still kind of coming out of college and high school, thinking that, you know, there's no way that that could be true. And then what I found is, you know, again, can't speak for women, but men, uh, you know, we get into the grind of things and, you know, we feel like we have a lot of acquaintances, uh, but honestly, that could be true. And so today, as we're talking about the right kind of friends, not just acquaintances, not just the people that fill our contacts and certainly nothing connected to social media, but when it comes down to real friends, this is how we're going to approach our time together. Let's pray as we uh, jump in. Father, we thank you for this afternoon. We thank you for everybody listening online or here in this room. I pray, God, that you would help us to be honest today. And Lord, help us to be willing to do personal inventory. Help us to think about what it is that you would have us hear from you. And then more importantly, Lord, give us the courage to, and the willingness to respond. We love you. We thank you. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to take our regular offering at this juncture in our service, and this is not our everyone at the end of the service moment, like campaign kind of a thing. This is just a regular moment in, in our service for our regular offering. So I just want to say this. If you're visiting here today, you don't have to worry about giving. You can give if you'd like, but uh, honestly, this is for a time for people who are part of Kensington. If you didn't come prepared to give in the auditorium, you could do it electronically. Uh, you can give on your texting uh, app, or uh, you can just text the word Kensington to 77977. Follow the prompts. You can do it through the Kensington app or the website, or give online as well. But honestly, we are just always careful to say we recognize that giving financially is a challenge, uh, but yet it is exactly what God calls us to do, to further our faith and dependence on him, but also to propel the church forward uh, together. So thank you for doing that. And so as that's happening, let me start with a basic premise that I think we all have known and we, we experience throughout life, and that is our friends can propel us toward good things or bad things. Isn't that true? Good things or bad things. And so let me just go ahead and tell you, I remember uh, my going skiing with my older brother, Tommy, just maybe eight or nine years ago, I think this was, and we were in up north in Michigan somewhere, can't even remember where it was, but I dropped my glove when I was on the ski lift, and it was at a really high point, it went on one of the runs, and we kind of saw it, and my brother said, well, let's ski down and buy you another glove, and I said, are you kidding me? That glove had like a thing that went all the way up here to make sure that like no snow gets in, it was like an expensive glove. It was like $12.95. I'm like, I'm not skiing down and spending that kind of money. We're going to ski down and grab that glove. So we went ahead and tried it. You know, we found it. And we discovered that it was on a black diamond closed off run that had patches of grass on it. But it had like half snow. But we could see it. It was down there. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, it's, we're not able to get that, right? And this looked like the whole thing was shut off for, for something. And my brother somehow convinced me that we could do this. He said, Chris, I think we could do this. He goes, look, there's snow here, there's snow here. If you just avoid that area, we could just do one of these and one of these, and we can get down there, and you can get, you know, he goes, and then we'll just like kind of, as soon as we get your glove, we can just kind of, you know, move on through this. There's a real thick tree line, but we saw like people skiing like vaguely through there. We're like, it looks like there's another run over there. We'll just walk through the tree line, and then we'll just go down that run. And so I, I, I don't know how, but somehow he convinced me. I went from like, uh, there's no way that this is possible to, yeah, yeah, we could do this. And so we both kind of started to go, and then he held back, and I went first. And in retrospect, I don't know what that was all about. I think maybe it was maybe like, oh, I'm sorry, you first. It could have been that. I'd like to believe that. But it was probably more like, ha, ha, I'm about to watch what happened next. Because I went down, and immediately, even though that my skis were on white, apparently it was not very thick. It was just really thin. And so my, my skis hit grass. And how many of you know what happens when your skis hit dirt or grass, it stops immediately like glue. And not just any glue, like Coyote Roadrunner glue, right? I, I, I hit it, my skis froze, and I did not freeze. And I went out of my skis, and I tumbled down. And believe it or not, I kid you not, I got injured, like, like quite injured. It rolled all the way down, and I rolled. And when I finally looked up, I was like, oh, look, my glove. So <laughs> I had my glove. 
My skis slid down. I grabbed it, and I, and I, I hobbled through, uh, you know, the, the wooded area to the next run, only to discover that that run was a double black diamond with moguls. And so I was thinking, oh, no, right? Th like, this was a bad decision on multiple levels. So I went ahead and tried to start skiing, and that didn't go well. Okay, I fell like five or six times because moguls are hard. You know what moguls are? They're those bumps, right? And so I fell really hard, and then finally I ended up basically like putting my skis on, then sitting my bottom on the ground, and then just doing this the rest of the way down. <laughs> Thinking this, oh, how did I let him talk me into this? I'm going over the hills like this, just going over the hills. And then the people skiing around me are mad because they're not forgiving because moguls are hard and people aren't necessarily professional. So they're like almost hitting me and they're yelling, they're like, you know, coming by, hey, blankety blank. And I'm like, shut up, and I'm like, shut up, <laughs> stop yelling at me. I'm thinking to myself, this is horrible, right? And so I, I, it's just, it's, it's inevitable that the influences, the friends around you are going to influence you to do something either good or bad, and sometimes it'll stick out as a memory. Hey, you are the product of these three things. You're a product of your relationships, your experiences, and your decisions. Isn't that true? And the funny thing about this is that your relationships have a lot of impact on the next two. The first one has the most prominent impact on the next two because chances are your experiences and your decisions, you can attach a person to it. In fact, I would venture to say this. If you were to think about your greatest regret or your greatest success, you could probably attach an influence or a friend who was there with you or maybe a family member or somebody who nudged you along and encouraged you. The three most prominent relationships are these relationships. Your relationship with God, your relationship with your family, and your relationship with your friends. This is actually a biblical order, by the way. These are the, most three, these are the three most important relationships. Now, this whole series that we're in is about you know, trying to propel us forward with our relationship with God and how sometimes our family of origin could either hinder or help that. And if you missed that, go online and watch that because that was all about family last week. And then this week, we're talking about friends. But if I were to ask you to picture, uh, like, uh, could, imagine a way to control the influences in your life with a dial, a dial sort of like this. If you were able to dial in God at certain times of your life, if you were to go back in time and dial out the neighbor next door or dial in a little mom or dial out a little dad, I bet you that there are, there's a chance that you could avoid your greatest regret in life. Think about it. You can go back in time and be like, I remember this time. Let's, I'm just going to dial her right out, you know? And it's like you could avoid that because that's how much relationships are a part of all of those choices. And so inevitably, our friends, there's really three categories, but our friends can uh, uh, affect us in these ways. Either, number one, they're going to hold us back from anything good and they're bad influences. The second category is obvious. There's good influences, but there's a third category. And the third category is that there's a lot of friends that we have that don't do either. They're, they're like neutral. And those, are, they're, those aren't bad friends. It's just important to recognize that that is a category, that they're not over here, that they're over here. So when it comes down to it, um, we, the Bible has a lot to say about friends. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 15. It says, don't be misled for bad company corrupts good character. Now, when you see that, your, your brain says, well, that's obvious. But yet, isn't it true? This is the reason why this is so powerful. Isn't it true that when people approach you and say, I believe that friend is a bad influence on you, what do you say? No, they're not, right? And it's saying, don't be misled. And you're like, well, how relevant is the Bible? Well, how relevant are these conversations you're having? Because you're saying, no, come on, no, they're not. No, 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 no. The biblical principle is, don't be misled. If they have bad character, or if, they, you know, if, they, if they're bad company, they'll corrupt your, corrupt your character. Look at Proverbs chapter 13. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. So these warnings are all there about friends, but also uh, it propels us toward the right kind of friends. Proverbs chapter 27 reads this way. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And of course, that's a, you know, that means man or woman. It, it basically means that when two people, just like two swords, sharpen each other, uh, we are designed to make each other better, to encourage each other. And, and we all need a person in our life that sharpens us or, or moves us down the field when it comes to not only good choices, but especially with our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so uh, a lot of us in here, we may not even really 
uh, maybe we're not convinced that we need friends, you know, or maybe for some of you in here, you are convinced that you do need good friends, except you're just, you're just not able to connect very well. So maybe for some of you, it's a challenge. You don't connect well. I want to read something on my phone that I found, uh, and it's uh, written by the author, psychiatrist Edward Hallowell, who wrote The Power of Human Connection. He writes that for most people, the two most powerful experiences in life are achieving and connecting. Connecting has to do with re our relational world, and achieving has to do with our accomplishments. Hallowell points out that in our society, we are getting increasingly devoted to, obsessed with, and enslaved by achieving. And yet, in, in this day and age, we are get in, getting increasingly bankrupt and impoverished when it comes to connecting. So he, he goes on and says, it is ironic that the achievement uh, for its own sake has become kind of an idol in our society. I have never known anyone who failed at relationships yet had a meaningful, meaningful and joy-filled life. Not a single person, he says. The past century was littered with people who achieved great things but never connected. People who accumulated vast amounts of wealth, fame, or power, but never acquired an open heart. People who had a full list of contacts, but not even one single friend. Every one of them died with bitter regrets. Every one. And so for a lot of you, maybe that's your challenge. Maybe your challenge is, I don't connect well. And so maybe an action step would be to pray toward the type of relationship that we are about to read uh, about and discover that, that King David of the Old Testament, we looked at him last week. We're looking at his friendship with Jonathan this week. If you were here last week, it's when he was a shepherd boy as a teenager. He got anointed as a king by the prophet Samuel. Samuel basically said, hey, you know, God has told me as a prophet that our current king, Saul, he used to be a godly man. He's not so much anymore. God has rejected Saul, and God has chosen this young 16-year-old kid to be king named David, son of Jesse. And so David then, you know, is kind of known as this next king. And it's kind of a weird thing that God just announced that. And there's really not too much Saul can do about it because Saul respects the prophet Samuel. And then we kind of skipped over David and Goliath, even though that's a great story. But David then, you know, he kills Goliath. He shows up at the army and he takes down Goliath as this shepherd boy, not even with a weapon, with a sling and a stone. And so eventually he makes his way to the palace and he starts hanging out with King Saul and his son, Jonathan. And that's where we pick up in chapter number 18 of 1 Samuel. It says, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. And I highlighted that because I want you to understand who this man is. This man is technically and legally in line for the throne. Now, I mean, it would be weird for the, the person who has a vested interest in protecting his future and his power and everything else of being king of all of Israel. It'd be, it'd be really weird if he befriended the young boy who was proclaimed king, you know, mysteriously by God, and yet that's what happens. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact. And that, that's like a, like a blood brothers kind of a moment here. And he says, he made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. And let me say something about that phrase. That is the exact quote on how Jesus taught us to love everyone. Do you remember in the New Testament when uh, a scholar of the law came to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? He said, the first commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, the second commandment is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus says that thousands of years later, it's literally the definition of unconditional love to place somebody as high as you would your own self and paying attention to them and have their vested interest in mind just as much as your own. And so this is the very definition of love. And so there's a couple different observations that we learn for us. From these, you know, from this story, we observe that number one, true friends sacrifice for you. Because after all, Jonathan is a phenomenal example of someone who set aside his own personal agenda, set aside his future, set aside what technically he could probably battle for or argue for and maybe even possibly win. But because he has, he's a friend to David and he loves this guy so much as a friend, he is willing to sacrifice something of himself. 
A solemn pact, true friends keep their promises. And what we discover is from the moment they made the pact to the end of their relationship when Jonathan passes away, Jonathan was always loyal and true. And then it says, he, 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 uh, true friends love unconditionally. Now, even before we continue on with the story, let me ask you this question. This is true reason for us to pause and take inventory and think to ourselves, I've got a lot of friends. I, I really do. I've got a ton of friends. How many friends fall on, you know, do these things? How many friends truly sacrifice and go without themselves and put my own needs in front of them? How many friends keep their promises always? How many friends love me absolutely unconditionally? And that's just getting started. Then it goes on. And it says, Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, his sword, his bow, and his belt. And by the way, these are military terms. Now, all of that, his robe, his tunic, his belt, his sword, and, and, and uh, his bow are all things that indicate to us and tell us, and we find out later, that Jonathan is a warrior. Jonathan is a warrior, and it is very obvious that Jonathan looks up to David as a warrior. And by the way, who wouldn't be inspired when you're sitting in front of a, you know, a crowd, uh, the entire nation of Israel is getting threatened by a giant, and all of a sudden a shepherd boy comes walking out in the middle of the field without a stitch of armor on him, grabs a stone and goes, Chica! and takes down a giant. I mean, who wouldn't be inspired by that kind of person? Now, you also have to read between the lines and understand, like, what history book have you ever read where the king's son's sword or the prince's sword is not a significant sword that probably had his family crest you know, on it somehow? It was probably fashioned just for him specifically. I mean, if he were to throw it down in the middle of a public square and people were to see it, they would probably say, that's the king's son's sword because they know what it is. It's valuable, and yet Jonathan is, is taking it off and giving it to David as a sign of sharpening each other, and that's actually what we learned from here. What we learned from here is that, uh, go ahead, go to the next screen, if you would, finishing this story. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. And so here's what we learned. Uh, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistines, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. Okay, so here we go. Finally, we're going to find out. Okay, here it is. True friends sharpen each other. It's the verse that we read where it says, iron sharpens iron. And I believe that that is what we've learned from here. There's another insight as well. And as we were reading, and it said that Saul was appointing David and giving him every promotion possible, what we find out in just a few verses is that Saul's motivation wasn't because he was trying to uplift David and make him important. The opposite was true. Saul was trying to give David more responsibility and shove him into the war so that David could be killed. And the reason why? Well, because, you know, after all, if you're not a king that's following necessarily the things of God, you know, and, and, you know, somebody's told you that, you know, that it's your time is coming to an end, and here's this punk that's been anointed king, your natural thought is going to be, you know, I, I reject that idea. And so Saul becomes jealous, he becomes enraged, right? And so this is what we, uh, what we find out as we continue and, and end the story. They sang and danced, the women who came to Saul, they sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals, and this was their song. Saul has killed in his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And this made Saul very angry. <laughs> After all, why wouldn't it, right? For somebody to say, yeah, it, it's a song, it's being known, it's being sung all around the country. And it's basically saying, our king has killed in the thousands, but this little apprentice in the tens of thousands, right? It just fuels the fire of jealousy for Saul. Then if you continue on and you skip to chapter 19, verse number one, it says, Saul now urged his servants and his son Jonathan to assassinate David. And if you try to think about that, why would a father, you know, go to his son's best friend and ask his son to assassinate his best friend? Well, you, you know, I don't think we have to go too far to, to understand King Saul's mindset. And what he's really thinking is, son, if you get rid of this guy, then I promise you the throne. Right? Because if David goes away, then the throne is, is Jonathan's. So what is he doing? He's, he's trying to use what he thinks is important and the most important motivator, the throne, the power, the money, the control, and he's pitching it to his own son and asks him to assassinate David. 
But Jonathan, because of his strong affection for David, told him what his father was planning. And so what we discover is that true friends are loyal. I have to believe that Jonathan told David not just because he was picking David over his dad, but because he was probably starting to see the writing on the wall. He was seeing that what God was saying is true about his own dad. And honestly, he was just saying, I'm going to choose right over wrong. And so Jonathan chose sides. And so this is another thing for you and I to take our kind of our inventory and say, do we have friends are completely loyal in our lives? And so it's, it's uh, is, are we finishing the story here? The next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. And then he says, the king must not sin against his servant David, Jonathan said. And by the way, that phrase is punishable by death. The king must not sin. And really what he's saying is, is anybody who goes into a king's courtroom or into his chamber and questions his authority or his judgment It's punishable by death. And he doesn't say dad. He says the king, and not just make a mistake, sin against David. He's never done any harm to you. He's always helped you in any way he could. Have you forgotten about the time he risked his life to kill the Philistine giant and how the Lord brought a great victory to all the Israelites as a result? Then he goes on and he he pleads with his dad. You were certainly happy about it then. Why would you murder an innocent man like David? There is no reason for it at all, exclamation mark. And it says, so Saul listened to Jonathan and vowed, As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. And that promise and that vow made by the king lasted for five minutes because he turned around and tried to kill him with a spear just just like five minutes later. So, so But here's what we're learning. We're learning that as far as Jonathan and their friendship goes, true friends risk themselves to protect you. And so here's this unbelievable friendship you know, that, that just describes the best sort of friend that you want in your life. So let me ask you this question. I remember one time uh, going to a speaking engagement at an event called 722 at North Point in Georgia, and a man named Billy Phoenix got up on the stage, and he kind of uh, gave a scenario, and I've always remembered it, and so I'm going to give it to you. Uh, now, the caveat to this scenario is, is that you have to exclude all family. No family can count, only friends. So here's what he says. He says, imagine you're at home and you get woken up at four in the morning by a phone call. And the phone call uh, comes in and it's all muffled. It's like, you know, and you're like trying to hear and it's, and it's a friend on the other line. It's your good friend. Now you could insert or think about like one of your best friends and just think that like that's the person who's calling you, okay? And the friend says to you, I can't explain why, But um, trust me when I say this is important, but I need you to get on a plane the first thing, like right now or tomorrow morning, and meet me on Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. And I can't tell you why, but it's important. And that's all they tell you. And you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're like, are are you serious right now? Yes, I'm absolutely serious. Hey, do you realize what you're asking me? You know how expensive a plane trip is to Mount Kilimanjaro with no explanation, with no sound advice, with no reasoning, no logic? Are you trying to tell me that you want me to miss work, which I'm probably going to get in trouble? I may even lose my job. Do you know what you're asking? But this friend says to you, yes, please. You're my friend. I love you. I know exactly what I'm asking. I can't explain it, but tell me. Trust me, it's that important. Please meet me as soon as you can on Mount Kilimanjaro tomorrow. Thanks. Click. Okay, now let me ask you this question. How many people in your life would you immediately just do it for? Not family, friends. Where you would say, I can't believe that I don't understand why, but it's Josh Eisenhart. And if it's my buddy Josh, I'm doing it. Right? There's, there's at least three in my life. There's Josh, there's, there's Jeff Miller, there's Dave Wilson, there's probably a few more. But, but, but when your answer is, I don't understand it, I can't believe this, but it's Josh. Josh called me. So what do you do? You go to the bank, you grab all your money, you drain your money, you buy the ticket, and then my wife says, what are you doing draining the bank account? And you're like, be quiet, woman. And then you just <laughs> buy the ticket. Right? By the way, that would never happen. So I would never say that. But like, you just buy the ticket and you go, right? Because it's like, hey, I don't understand it. But, but it's, it's, it's Jeff. In my case, you know, my other buddy, Jeff. Je- it's Jeff. And so I'm going, right? So let me ask you a question. Not only are you asking yourself, how many people in my life would I do that for? And, and if you come up with one, you're blessed. 
If you come up with two or three, like that's just, a, that's pretty good, right? And then the scarier question is this, how many people would do that for you? That's not family. Because that's a scarier question. You're like, what? No, I don't know. You know, because you're like, would they do it? You don't know. But how many people would do that for you? And you think to yourself, wow, that is a great test of, you know, of people that would, you know, just be there for you. I believe that we have at least three categories of people that God calls us to have in our lives. And I have an object lesson for each one. And so here's the first one. I believe the first category of friends that we all need to have are like mirrors. And these are the people that, that as soon as you look into a mirror, you, you immediately know reality. How many of you know this? Uh, you've ever done this. You've, you've completely done this. You've spent all day with friends or family, and then you finally get a chance to look in the mirror, and you go, I can't believe nobody told me I look like this. And you're going like this and, you know, trying to fix yourself. And you're like, why didn't anybody tell me I'm so embarrassed, right? Have you ever done that? You, you've done that, right? So a mirror is somebody who tells you the truth. Somebody tells you the hard truth, defines reality. Because when you look in the mirror, there's no getting around the reflection of who you are. And a, you know what a mirror is good for as well? To look behind you in your blind spots. Somebody who's able to tell you, you know, and inform you about the blind spots or perhaps, you know, the potential blind spots that, you know, may cause an accident in your life or the wake or turmoil around you that you leave behind you, right? I mean, you know, the best kind of friend in the world, I try to be this friend. Even if you're in a room with like five or six people, you know, and, and nobody's saying anything, I'm the type of person that says, you know, hey, you got a booger in your nose. It's right here. <laughs> just, just do this. You know, go blow, here's a napkin or something, right? And, and, and it's like, I want that person. You know why? Because you already know what I'm about to say. Otherwise, you walk around for 17 hours and everybody's like, hey, did you see that booger? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody ought to tell her. Yeah, I know, right? And that's way worse, isn't it? And so you want the booger friend. You, you, want, you want him or her. And so you need a friend who is able and willing and should tell you the hard truth about life. Look at Proverbs chapter 27 says, verse number five. It says, Proverbs 27, verse number five. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Oh, an, open, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. In other words, an enemy is, is gonna tell you what you wanna hear but don't need to hear, right? Uh, the Bible says that's not just a friend, that's, that's more like an enemy, a real friend is the person who gives it. Better are the kisses of, of a friend or, or, the, or the wounds of a friend than the, than the uh, kisses of an enemy, another version says. And so here's the second object lesson. I, I have the second type of friends that you want are spandex. And for men, you know what these offer? Support. I was going to choose an athletic supporter, and I thought Hispanics might be better. So support, because we need the people in our lives that support us through thick and thin. And when things are going well, they're right there cheering with us. And when things are going poorly, they're right there caring for us. And they're the person that's going to show up. And Kensington has uh, you know, different values. We've covered the last two on two Wednesday nights on our midweek services. But one of our values is as a family. We, we strive to live as a family. And, and our qualifying question for that is, who are your 2 a.m. friends? They're the people that you can call at 2 a.m. And, and, and ask, and they're going to be there, right? The Bible tells us, you know, that we need to be there for each other as a church. In fact, the book of Galatians, chapter number 6, says it this way. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. And this is written in the context of the church. Galatia was a church, and Paul was writing to it and saying, this is how Christ designed the church, so that you and I would share each other's burdens, our sorrows, our pains, our needs, our, our you know, things to pray about. And he says, if you think, and I love this, if you think you are too important to help someone, and he's speaking to someone who says, I'm exempt, he says, you are only fooling yourself, you are not that important. Isn't that great? Uh, what I really love about this is that, like, that's in the Bible. And so you could technically, like, get rid of all these words and just write down, you are not that important, Galatians 6, 3. Walk out and just give it to somebody. Here, I have a Bible verse for you. You are not that important. <laughs> Boom. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Okay. So just kidding. Context is everything. And then here's the third one. The third one is this. We need friends who are like a scale. And you know the thing about a scale is when you stand on a scale and the numbers show up, those numbers are there. I mean, it is what it is, isn't it? I, like, it, it tells you the truth about everything. And, and, and uh, you know, there's no getting around it, which is why so many people avoid standing on scales. But when you do stand on it, this represents the kind of person who's going to help you change. 
This is the type of person. I mean, it's not just support. Support is good. But this is a really rare type of person. A person who goes out of his way to say, I am going to be a part of encouraging you, pushing you, even in some cases making you make the right choice. And, and you, you think to yourself, the type of person that this is, is whenever I'm around her, whenever I'm around her, I make better choices. I become a better person. Whenever I'm around him, I, I just... I, I just feel closer to God because he or she inspires me, encourages me, and literally helps me become a better person. Now, that can be true of a spouse and a family member, but remember, this message is about friends. So who in your life falls under these categories? So let me ask you this question. Would you be, be willing to pray about this? For a lot of you, you'd say, I have a hard time connecting. Then pray that God would send you somebody that just relates to you so that you can connect. If you've, if you've listened to this message and you feel a little bit discouraged and say, you know what, quite honestly, I don't, I don't really have any friends like that, then just would you be willing to pray that God would surround you with the right kind of people? And maybe that's your prayer diligently. Be intentional about it. God, send me the right type of people, the bad people. Maybe, maybe for, for us, for a lot of us in this room, maybe the thing we need to pray is maybe it's time to pray about spending a little less time with those people. Right? And not that we want to, you know, like, we don't want to end our friendship at all. We just want to count the minutes and make them a little less because their influence is not good. And so if you have, you know, people in these categories, pray that God would send you and that we would be influenced by the right people to propel us on to the future that God has for us. Because here's what we all know. And this is true. This is true since you were a child. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And for a lot of you, if that's a brand new quote, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, I'm going to go home and tell that to my teenage daughter. Here, I'm going to write it down. Show me your friends. Here, look at this, honey. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. But truthfully, this is for adults as well. This is for everyone. This is true for our futures until the day we pass from this earth. And so that's, there's no shortage of, Bi of Bible verses that encourage us to take inventory, to be intentional, to pray about and to, and to take seriously the influence of friends in our lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be willing to pray the dangerous prayer of sending us the right kind of people in our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to be willing to look to you for these things. And I pray, Lord, that we would take seriously the influence uh, the influences that are around us. God, thank you for your truths. Thank you for the encouragement. I pray that we all may leave feeling inspired and motivated and challenged. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, I'm going to show you this next video. And this next video uh, was originally designed to be a part of our ending moment, which is our capital campaign, Everyone Moment. But honestly, once the video is produced and done, it actually completely ties into today's topic as well. Uh, it is all about friends, the influence of friends. We decided to do this. We decided to end kind of this big campaign moment with, with selecting two stories of people whose lives were radically changed because this building was built, which is very recent, right? Um, and so think about it this way. Uh, let me just say it this way. I don't know if you know this or not, but this building, uh, maybe I shouldn't even tell you this, this building was $15 million, most of which was given by people who do not attend this building. They were given by the people who actually have kind of put their projects on hold. Like Orion's waiting for some updates, Birmingham's wanting a new location, and all these different kind of things. They gave us their funds in good faith because of why? Because they believe in the mission of God. They believe, they believe that, like, they believe in reaching people, right? They believe in it. And so, and, and, we, and we do too, right? And so we decided to make this video to show people, like, when you gave your money and built this building, it wasn't in vain. So I want you to watch as these two incredible stories inspire us, and then I'll come back up and finish our time together. If I hadn't come to Kensington, I really don't know where I would be. I don't know if I would even be on this earth anymore. Didn't feel like I had anything going for me. Didn't feel like there was any chance of things moving forward. I didn't grow up in a church. I didn't really know of any churches in my area. I still couldn't name any churches in the town that I grew up in. 
and I didn't really have God as like somebody I could have a relationship with in my life. The first time I went to church was at MSU. I took a friend, she had hurt her leg and she needed a ride. So I took her to church and I was like, I'll just hang out in the car. Like, you can just go in, it'll be fine. Like I'll be here for you when you come out. And she was like, all right, like, don't be stupid, come in. And it was unlike anything I could have ever imagined a church being. Like there was music, there was people singing, people were getting out, people were taking notes. And I was like, that's like insane. Like I need to find something like that by my house. So I started going to a church around here. I went there for like two years pretty passively. Like just when I came home from school. I turned 21, things kind of changed a little bit. After school, I would go out with a friend and we'd drink a beer. I mean, I started to kind of feel like that was a way for me to connect with other people. It got rid of the anxieties, the depression, the drinking just completely picked up. Um, I went from drinking once a week on a Thursday night to every single night, all day, every day. I knew that I could use the Bible and God's word to live my life better. And that's what I really hung on to. The relationship with God, I didn't really fully understand until I came to Kensington. And I spoke to people about their relationships with God and how like you could actually be in relationship with him and it be like a two-way thing and not just you praying to him or asking him for things. Six months ago, which was September, um, I had attempted suicide. I just felt like all hope was lost. Um, so I took all the sleeping pills I had. I ended up throwing it all up, um, getting it out of my system. And I still had to go to the ER because I was Delirious. I didn't even know where I was. I barely even remember doing it. The shame that I had from even attempting that or thinking that kind of just overwhelmed me, and I just kind of didn't care where I was at. I was talking to my mom one day, and I just didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I, crying all day, um, and she goes, well, why don't you get a hold of Steve? Um, he works at Kensington, the youth pastor. Go for a drive with him, talk to him, just like let him know. He was always the biggest support growing up for you. So we I drove, uh, drove around for literally hours, and um, I told, I got home, told my mom that it was the best conversation I've had during my recovery over the last three years. He goes, well, would you consider going to Kensington? Um, just, you know, don't have to come back if you don't want to, just give it a try. I was at a point where I was, I might as well, might as well try it. I don't have much to lose. Since the building's been open, um, I started coming to church every single Sunday. I started going to midweek at other campuses. I've gotten involved in 1829. Um, Sundays, I'm in the nursery. I just got involved with EDGE. I'm in small groups on Monday with a group of 1829 girls. It's great people to be around and to confide in and be vulnerable with, which is something that I've never had before. I feel very safe here. If I'm not around like God-loving people, I very much feel lost still. You know, he's in everything and he's in every one of us and I think that's beautiful. Before then, I didn't think that I could have that, that unconditional love that God offers. My very first week here, they started doing the promotions for their baptism. It was a period of time where I kind of just wanted to move past the past and start focusing on the future. I was walking up to the stage like, oh man, I'm going to be so nervous, I'm going to be freaking out. I'm uh, just going to be too awkward to like even think about celebrating or anything like that. I was kind of expecting to dunk my head and then get out and be like, okay, see you guys. It definitely didn't happen like that. We 
dunked my head and it was like just such an intense moment. I like jumped out of the water. I hit the camera that was like next to me. It was just so overwhelming. Like I threw my arms in the air and me and Steve hugged each other and it was like just, I don't know, it just felt like so much weight was lifted off my shoulders. Like I had another chance, like something I had been looking for for so long. It really was a gift, like giving anything towards putting this building into my life, especially, was a true gift from God. Thinking of this building not existing makes me want to cry, honestly. I didn't think I'd get emotional. To everyone who gave to the campaign that um, helped build this campus, helped build, a, build the Clinton Township campus, the impact you have had on, on my life has been unbelievable. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Uh, so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everyone who helped make this happen. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Yeah, it's just incredible. And my guess is that if we were to go around the room with microphones, we can come up with dozens of stories that are just as impactful because God is doing incredible things. Uh, but uh, these two stories in particular are, are just so great because I know, Brittany, I've not met Eric yet, uh, but uh, I was up there. And by the way, if I would have known that little clip of him being baptized was going to make it to this video, I would have been like chatting with Sonia nonchalantly behind. But uh, it was just an incredible moment. In fact, uh, I, I, I was told that Brittany or Eric might be actually here, right? So Brittany's there. Oh, Brittany's there. Oh, there you go. There you guys are. That's awesome. Hey, Eric, what's up, buddy? That's awesome. And so... Um, yeah, and so it's just incredible to see uh, just two examples of yet re represents so many people. Now, we're going to end our service in a very cool way. Both services have been pretty incredible today. So here's what we're asking you to do. Let me give you the logistics first, then I'll tell you how we're going to respond to the logistics. Um, the, the back of this here uh, has uh, an envelope that's normally kind of right here, and then uh, the, the green ticket that I already have torn off right here, and that's what they were handing on the way in. In fact, ushers, if you want to just kind of walk the aisles, if you need one of those, uh, go ahead and lift up your hand and they'll get you one. But let me just go ahead and ask, uh, tell you this. Uh, the green certificate, we've already been over this a couple of different weeks. So the green certificate is just a way to say, hey, I'm going to contribute in some way. Okay, so it's definitely a contribution type ticket, right? And, and the contribution is like, I've already given my pledge, but here's a one-time gift or, you know, like, uh, or here's the rest of my pledge or, and this is a big category for Clinton Township, I'm brand new. I wasn't even here three years ago. And so I'm going to give a one-time gift. Now, if you don't have like a, a, a ticket card uh, to fill out, I encourage you to write on something and throw it in this box. But here's another thing. There are definitely, definitely people, maybe even up to half the people in here, you're not going to necessarily give something physically today. You're going to give online or you have given online. But it's important to write that down and say, hey, I, I gave a one-time gift of this amount so we can total it up and then we can come back a couple days later, a couple weeks later and say, guess what? And celebrate. And so if you gave something online or you plan on giving something online, please write it down. Now we're going to ask everybody at the end of this service to actually, like, not now, but just in a minute, we're all going to get up and walk toward this north set of stairs and walk across what we kind of put together like, it's called Finish Strong, so it's a finish line. And then we're going to have all of our team out here. In fact, hey team, come on out here and these guys are going to give you high fives and then you're going to drop whatever you have right here, right? And so, um, and then, and then listen, listen, listen. I know that there are some people, like as soon as we stand up, there'll be some people that says, you know, say that like, you know, I'm not going to walk across at this time. That's totally fine. You can slip out. No pressure. But here's what I hope. I hope that every person in here will want to walk across symbolically. And so symbolically, whether you have anything to drop, drop in there or not, symbolically to say, I'm a part of this church. I'm, I believe in the mission of this church. I'm finishing strong. I'm walking across because I want to be a part of something great. I want to be a part of something bigger than myself. And I believe in what we're doing. And so, you know, you can walk up here for a couple reasons. Number one, to get a view. Maybe you don't know what it looks like from up here. It's really cool. But more importantly, to say, I'm a part of this crew and I'm a part of this family and a part of this team. 
And let me just challenge you with one last thing and say this. Every person in here can give something. There's no doubt in my mind. Everybody can give something. So if you say, well, is $20 too small? You realize how $20 times 14,000 who attend on the weekend, you realize what that would total up to be? Was $200 a small gift? You know, you're searching for everything. You're mustering everything up. And you're not going to go out to dinner for another month, but you're going to give $200. Is that, is that a small gift? We're trying to close the gap of 14, or, uh, you know, the 4 million. No, it's not too small of a gift. So whatever it is, you can give a dollar, right? But I, but I hope it's a lot more than that. But, but I'm just asking if you would just be a part of this moment. So in just a minute, these guys are going to sing. We're going to walk across the stage. And then we're just going to ask you to go right out to the lobby. Just go straight to your cars. Or hopefully if you're a visitor, stop by the hub. If you're interested in the new Anthem Church in Mount Clemens, stop by the booth. And if you have kids, you might as well stop by and grab your kids on your way out. Okay, so, but we want to do this thing together, all right? So as we sing, let's all get up, head toward this uh, thing and walk across the line together. Let's go. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah i uh-huh. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder.